Hey guys, this is Pastor Tim, and we're back at it with the book of Ecclesiastes, and I hope you're finding <clears throat> some good fruit from this study, um, even if it's just sort of a, a good biblical distraction from the chaos of COVID-19 and, and the disruption of our lives. Things are changing every single day, and uh, it's becoming clearer and clearer that we need to be around fewer and fewer people, and uh, and be kind of hunkered down in our own homes, and, and more and more health officials are uh, encouraging that kind of activity, and for that matter, our leaders are as well. So I pray that you're taking this seriously. Uh, I pray that you're continuing to wash your hands on a regular basis, especially after you've encountered individuals, whether you have to go to the grocery store or the hospital or whatever the case might be. Uh, so just take those uh, precautionary measures uh, but we're, we're looking at the book of Ecclesiastes as an opportunity for us to get some perspective uh, on, on life's matters, but certainly this season that we find ourselves in. And, and again, as I've mentioned before, I can't think of a much better book in the Bible to give us perspective than the book of Ecclesiastes. So today we're, we're in chapter 2, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 11. So let me read to you those verses, and if you need to go grab your Bible, just hit pause and uh, come on back and pick it up from there. And again, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. <clears throat> Chapter 2, starting in verse 1. I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure, enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of pleasure, what use is it? I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their lives. I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the children of man. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil. And this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it. And behold, all was vanity, and a striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. Well, this is an interesting section, isn't it? Solomon makes it real clear up front that he decided to find out if pleasure, if the pursuit of pleasure would satisfy his desires. This implies, of course, that there was some kind of emptiness. There was something going on in his life that he wasn't satisfied and and certainly indicates more overtly that God was not his greatest satisfaction. And so he sought to fill that void with pleasures. Now we can see that most of these pleasures are simply something, are simply various things that are, that are worth pursuing at times and worth enjoying, that the pleasures in and of themselves are not inherently evil. However, when they define us, when they're the only things that we long for, then they become evil. And, of course, as he points out in a couple of occasions here, they are vanity. And as a reminder, vanity comes from the Hebrew word havel, which means fleeting or vaporous. It's a whisper. It's a mist. So all the pleasures that he pursued were fleeting. They didn't ultimately satisfy him. Let's just walk through some of these things and recognize that some of these things are actually decent things as long as they don't define us and consume us, but they certainly were defining Solomon. He says in verse 2, I said of laughter, it is mad. 
So he tried, you might say, to seek comic relief. Anybody here ever heard a comedian and had a nice evening just listening to somebody? I know our family loves to listen to Tim Hawkins. We can't get enough of him, and whenever we need just a laugh, whatever the reason is, we love to listen to some of his humor. But we don't worship Tim Hawkins. We don't live for the sake of trying to find comic relief. And yet Solomon was seeking great satisfaction and fulfilling whatever void was in his life with comedy as at least part of it. He, I said, he said in verse 3 that he cheered his body with wine. Once again, wine in and of itself is not evil, but we also know it can be abused. Too much wine can lead to drunkenness and all kinds of terrible things, including death or maybe even the death of somebody else. We all have heard of way too many instances where some drunk driver uh, killed somebody because of uh, their inebriated status as they were driving. So we know it can be abused. At the same time, wine in and of itself is a gift from God and something to be enjoyed. And yet Solomon pursued it in the wrong attitude, it seems. Verse 4, he said, I made great works. He built houses and planted vineyards for himself. Who doesn't want to have a nice vineyard or a nice house? He goes on to say that he built gardens and parks, planted all kinds of fruit trees. Who doesn't like to take a stroll through a garden and enjoy a, a well-structured park that's got trees, fruit trees that smell wonderful and flowers that are beautiful? And yet these things were consuming Solomon. They weren't just um, decorations on his life. They were becoming far too central in his pursuit of pleasure. He made pools from which to water the growing trees. So he clearly demonstrated he had engineering talent. We see later on that he pursued silver and gold, and there's nothing wrong with having financial resources. But we all know there's a lot wrong with being defined by the pursuit of wealth and how it can consume us. He had singers, and we see he had concubines. And of course, we know the story from Solomon that he had so many wives and concubines, a thousand total. Who could possibly need that much pleasure in any of these areas? But Solomon pursued him with the desire to fill that void with the various pleasures of life. And so he says towards the end of this section that he surpassed everybody that had gone before him in Jerusalem. And indeed, he surpassed anybody throughout the world. But in the end, he found that it was vanity striving after wind, chasing his tail, not satisfying him. And one of the things that I find really interesting is at the end of this section in verse 11, he says, Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it. And behold, all was vanity and striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. This is where I think you and I come in. We can look at all these things that he pursued and say, well, I'm not pursuing silver and gold like he did and a thousand women around me and building my own parks and so forth. We could all say that we don't seek or have the ability to pursue things like that. But at the same time, Solomon, as the wealthiest man in the world, had all the resources available to him. So he used the resources disproportionately. And that's the point, I think, of verse 11. He realizes that all the effort that he expended in the pursuit of these pleasures did not satisfy him. And you and I understand how much effort in our own lives goes into pursuing various pleasures. We may not have all the resources Solomon had, but we have the same thing he had, which is time. And when we expend so much of our time seeking pleasure, we put ourselves on the same playing field as Solomon. And we'll come to realize the same thing he did, that it was a disproportionate use of his time to seek those pleasures. And we share in that disproportionality. And if you don't believe me, ask, answer this question. Compare how much time you spend watching TV to how much time you spend in the Word of God. Compare how much time you spend pursuing various ho hobbies and pleasures and things designed to bring you joy compared to how much time you spend building relationships with people. 
Compare how much time you spend looking at the internet, looking for various things that you want to purchase and buy and make your life a little bit better compared to how much time you invest in wanting to share the gospel with people in your life that don't know Jesus. And then ask yourself, are you spending your time disproportionately in pursuit of the pleasures that you think are going to make your life more comfortable or, even worse, to fill a void that is not being filled by the Lord? And so we might look at what Solomon went through and said, hey, there's an, I don't have that problem. I don't pursue the kinds of things he did, but once again... He had something that we have, and that is time. And how we use our time is incredibly valuable. Solomon was a wise man. He pursued all of these things, even with wisdom. I love Dwayne Garrett's quote on this. Dwayne Garrett wrote a commentary on the book of Ecclesiastes, probably the best one out there in the New American Commentary series. And he said that his pursuit, Solomon's pursuit of pleasure, was rationally controlled indulgence. I love that phrase. He never let himself get to the point of debauchery, but he pursued pleasure with all kinds of energy, with all the resources he had, never letting himself get completely out of control. And I think most of us can identify with that as well. We might say, well, I don't let myself get so drunk or get so consumed with pursuing money or get so consumed with building my business or buildings or this, that, or the other thing. I don't get so consumed that it controls me. Well, neither did Solomon. But he found out at the end that he didn't invest his time in the best way that he could, and he wasn't satisfied with his excessive pursuits of pleasure. And so let me encourage you, as we sit around now in our homes a little bit more, and we don't have as many things on the internet or on TV to bring us pleasure, the kind of pleasure that we had anticipated seeing with March Madness and the nicer weather that was about ready to come, to go spend a ton of time in our gardens, or the masters, speaking very autobiographically here. All these things that we look forward to coming in the spring that we're not going to be able to invest our time pursuing, these offer us an opportunity, I think, from God to reevaluate what we're doing with our time. Are we investing it proportionately in such a way that we'll find greater satisfaction with the Lord and less satisfaction with the things of this world and, most importantly, the pursuit of the things of this world because they will take up all of our time. And so let me encourage you, reflect on this as we're at home. Reevaluate Maybe reprioritize some things so that when all this passes, and it will, as all things do, seasons come and seasons go, when this passes, we'll have a different mindset. All of us will have a different mindset. And we can be probably a little bit more godly in our lives, and our church can be more outwardly focused and be more targeted on fulfilling the Great Commission and doing the things that the Lord has called us to do so that He alone would satisfy all of our pleasures. We don't need to be hedonistic. We don't need to go out and seek pleasure in everything because we have Solomon here to demonstrate and prove to us that it's vanity. So let's learn from him. Let's learn from the Word of God and redouble our efforts to invest more in the Lord and His work, and in that we will find the greatest satisfaction. May God bless you.